Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming to this webinar. I'm very excited to talk about uh, community building. Um, obviously, working for Kickstarter, this is going to be a little more Kickstarter focused, um, but I'm happy to kind of like uh, speak to some larger community building uh, topics too. Um, so hi, who am I? <laughs> uh, my name is Anya Combs. Um, I've been in games uh, 11 years. This is my 11th year in uh, the games industry, which is pretty cool and exciting. I'm the former Addicting Games developer relations person. Um, I was at Addicting Games for a very long time. So if you made a Flash game and uh, licensed it to Addicting Games, I probably have chatted with you. Uh, I so Addiction Games was owned by uh, Nickelodeon Viacom, and so uh, I subsequently worked for Nickelodeon for a long time through the Addiction Games brand. Um, I've done production, I've done development, I've done research, I've done you know community building, I've done social media strategy things. Um, the only thing I haven't done is any like game design or coding, but pretty much everything else I've, I've pretty much done in the games industry. Um, but uh, the time at Nickelodeon was was great. It was about seven and a half years, uh, and I realized very quickly that the corporate structure was not for me. Um, so this opportunity at Kickstarter came along, and I've been at Kickstarter almost four years, which is really great. Um, I really enjoy chatting with creators and doing sort of all the outreach stuff, which is super fun. Um, so what is Kickstarter? Just quickly, just in case you don't know, Kickstarter's mission is to bring creative projects to life. We do that by connecting people to the projects that they love, and we like to think that we do that better than anyone. Um, people from nearly every country on Earth have backed a project. Um, we have representation in all seven continents, and that does include Antarctica, which is pretty cool and exciting. So when we are talking about community, the community on Kickstarter specifically is very, very big and robust. Um, just to kind of put some numbers to some of these things. So Kickstarter has the largest and most engaged funding community. So 17 million people have backed a Kickstarter project. And I believe of that 17 million, 5.2 million uh, people have backed more than one project. So the community on Kickstarter is not just robust and um, engaged, they also come back consistently, which is pretty great. Uh, and 56 million pledges have been made to all projects in uh, the lifespan of Kickstarter. And Kickstarter is about 10 years old, so there's a lot of pledges that have been made uh, to, games, to projects on Kickstarter. Uh, backers on Kickstarter have already pledged 4.1 billion euro, funding over 171,000 creative projects, which is pretty exciting. So again, when we're talking about community, 10 years of Kickstarter, very robust community that exists. For the games category stats specifically, uh, so there's about a billion euro that have been pledged to games as a whole. So that includes video games, tabletop games, card games, just anything that is a game over a billion euro have been pledged, which is pretty exciting. Um, over 18,000 projects uh, have, have launched, which is also extremely, you know, tons of projects, tons of people, all that good stuff, and three and a half million backers. Uh, so of that three and a half million backers, that's roughly split almost 50-50 between tabletop and video games, which I think is a really interesting stat too. So we're looking at these numbers and we're saying, okay, cool, there's a community on Kickstarter. Um, how did that community come about? And, and why is it important for me as a game developer to build a community? Um, so specifically for Kickstarter, and this is this is a, the funding progress of Boyfriend Dungeon, a game that funded last year from a team called Kitbox. Um, cool, very weird, interesting, exciting game. Um, so specifically for Kickstarter, one of the reasons that you need to build a community is if you look at this pie chart here, there's sort of an orange and a green part. That green part is roughly the all, the, all of these people that I'm talking about, right, that three and a half million uh, people that have pledged to a games project on Kickstarter. Um, that 30% represents the people that are existing on Kickstarter that are coming to Kickstarter and looking for games to pledge to. So that means there's roughly 70, it's like 65 to 70% of uh, the pledges that come in through Kickstarter is actually through the external community that creators are able to bring in, right? So um, looking at this funding graph, you know, obviously like they did a, 
a wild amount of community building um, and marketing and really just kind of like getting their community to come to Kickstarter. Um, so they were able to fund very quickly, but they still fall within this, this uh, guideline that we have that is uh, roughly 30% of pledges coming through Kickstarter, which is our community, but the community that uh, Kit Fox was able to bring in um, is really, really important here. So the really the heart and the soul of the of bringing a game to Kickstarter is the community that you are able to bring in to each project, which is pretty cool. Um, the other thing that I did want to mention here that's really important is that the community that you build, uh, they are going to stay with you in the long run. They're going to they're going to come to your next project. They're going to engage with you on social media. They're essentially going to become not just your fans, but your evangelists for what you're doing. So it's not something where you're like, okay, cool, well, I have all these Twitter followers and they pledge to my Kickstarter project and then I never hear from them again. They want to stay with you through essentially like your entire run as a games creator. These people will become, you know, your, not just your community, but like, they become sort of the heart and the soul of what it is that you're trying to make. So it's important to like make sure that you build a space that's that's comfortable for people. Um, so giving you a lot of information uh, and I'm saying it's, it's important to build a community. And so I think you're probably asking yourself, well, how do I build a community? Like what exactly do I need to do in order to like build this space for people to come to? Um, luckily we live in the age of the internet uh, and so these are three of the biggest ways that I've seen people build a community, um, especially in the video game space. So social media is extremely important here. Um, I understand that social media is, is a bit of a contentious topic right now, um, but it is a space for you to kind of like really centralize your community. So Facebook, right? So Facebook, I personally kind of hate Facebook, but I also know I need it like not only just for my job, but also like, you know, to kind of keep in touch with people in my life. Um, but Facebook is a really, really powerful tool, especially if you have a specific page uh, devoted to, um, if not your game, then definitely your studio. So getting people to like that page, right? Like the, the trick with social media here is the posts that have consistent engagement will always kind of rise to the top. So posting consistently, posting once a day, planning those posts out, like having a strategy associated with Facebook. Same with Twitter. Twitter is a very, very powerful tool, especially for the games industry. All of the games industry is on Twitter. We are all constantly communicating with one another. We're constantly like uh, direct messaging one another. We're sharing each other's content, right? It's the same thing with Facebook. The algorithms are set up so that uh, the content uh, that has that drives high engagement will kind of rise to the top. So being part of that, um, I want to make a note about Twitter which is that I think sometimes, and, and to, some, to a certain degree, Facebook too, I think sometimes what can, hap can happen is that uh, you can get bogged down with constantly promoting yourself. And the trick here is there's a level of authenticity that you really want to like maintain. So it's not as just, it's not as simple as just like liking a bunch of posts, but it's also sort of engaging with those posts, like hyping your friends up, being excited about what's going on, really sort of like, engaging with what's going on in, in whatever specific space that you want to be a part of. So if you have a game that's like a point and click adventure game, find the people that are part of that space on Twitter. Find who those uh, other fellow game developers are and talk to them. Engage in conversation with them. Fans of those types of games will then see, oh cool, there's a new creator that's come into this space. Maybe I want to check their game out. So like really kind of engage with that space. Um, and the last one here, and this is a really big one, especially for video games, is Discord. Because unlike Facebook and Twitter, where the algorithm is key here for kind of the cream rising to the top in terms of content, Discord is a space where you're able to centralize a lot of your communication. So having people come to your Discord um, is a way for you to like, uh, you can also, you can see kind of what's going on at all times because things aren't necessarily filtered, right? It's basically just like a giant chat room. Um, but you're also able to make sure that people see what you're posting. So if you want to do something where like once a week, every Tuesday, for example, you have like dev hour where from like 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. You just talk with the people that are in your discord as, a, as like the main creator of the game that you're making. That's a really, really beneficial tool for people to say like, oh, cool. This this creator wants to be a part of this space with us, which is, which is fantastic. 
there's a couple other ways to build a community. So online forums, um, TigSource is a great place for you to kind of just post your game and get feedback. Again, it's about engaging with people. There's sort of this online networking component that you want to be a part of. Um, and Facebook groups. Facebook groups are are weirdly beneficial. There's There's Facebook groups that run the gamut from like tabletop specific Kickstarter Facebook groups to video game Facebook groups, right? Like there's anything that you could possibly think of is, is exists in a Facebook group. So being a part of that and again, engaging with the content, uh, responding to feedback that when people ask for feedback, asking for feedback yourself, being a part of that. Um, Reddit, I think we have some questions about Reddit coming up. Reddit is, I am not a Reddit expert, um, so I'll be perfectly honest there. I know that Reddit has some rules in terms of like advertising and like self advertising and, and self um, promotion. But I think the thing again is that there are uh, like Reddit spaces where you're able to just kind of engage with the community. And I think that's Reddit is a tool and a very powerful tool for you to provide feedback for things. Um, but again, it's about sort of like building a community based on sort of the baseline of things. Um, and NDDB, NDDB is another, it's similar to like a TIG source where people can post their games, you can get feedback, you can respond to people. Again, it's just an online community that you definitely want to be a part of. Um, newsletters. So newsletters are extremely powerful. If you do not currently have a newsletter for your studio or for your game, you definitely need one. Um, we found on Kickstarter specifically, newsletters can be a really huge driving force for people to pledge to Kickstarter projects. Part of that is like Discord. Um, it's something that will immediately pop into someone's uh, email inbox versus like maybe seeing it on Twitter or maybe seeing it on Facebook based on algorithms. Uh, but newsletters are extremely powerful, are an extremely powerful tool. So um, there's a couple of different ways that you can get people to sign up for your newsletter. You should have like a pinned tweet on your Twitter that basically has your a link to your Discord, a link to your Facebook, and a link for uh, ways for people to sign up for your newsletter. When you're showing game at any like conferences or shows or even if you're just like out at like a bar or a cafe and maybe you're showing your game have a way for people to sign up for your newsletter and the weird trick here is having a writing utensil of some kind a pencil a pen whatever it is and just a sheet of paper people are more likely to give your their information their name and their email address versus signing up over like an ipad i don't exactly know why but I've seen it time and time again, but having a way for people to sign up for a newsletter is absolutely key. Um, so I know we're going to take a couple questions, but I, I wanted to provide my email address. So Anya at kickstarter.com, or you can just email the main games at kickstarter.com. That's totally fine. Um, so if we aren't able to get to your question, or if you are uncomfortable asking a question in this forum, I'm happy to answer any questions over email. And I think Natasha, can you still hear me? Hi, Anya. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We yeah, just have some technical issues, but I'm, oh, I'm no back. Problem. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> a pencil and paper would be a good strategy for online marketing. That's a weird <laughs> conclusion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Talk. Who would ever thought that pencil and paper would be a crucial thing in online I marketing? Know. I think it's I think it's because we're so conditioned to like sign up for things through our computers that's sort of like the analog way trick it's like a weird brain trick where you're like oh well nothing's ever gonna happen with this so <laughs> yeah it's funny it's funny um, I'm going to dive into some questions that came in through the audience uh, first one I think uh, is like a very very important one for game devs here when do you start announcing your game to the public because they're trying to fit it into their production process mm -hmm. and I think yeah, you, you feel that you should kind of involve your community already from production onwards, uh, not only upon launch or after launch, but when is the good, when is the golden point to start uh, involving people? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I, you know, I think to be perfectly honest, part of the answer here is I think it really depends on your game. Um, I am not a, mar I don't have a marketing background. And so this is just coming from years of kind of watching a lot of these things. Um, for Kickstarter specifically, you definitely want to announce maybe like two to three weeks out before your actual launch date of your project. Um, but for sort of a larger game space, 
I mean, I think it's totally fine to announce like six months to a year before your actual launch date. Um, that gives you a ton of lead time. The other thing here is like, it's not just necessarily announcing the game. It's also kind of the lead up to to like, how do you get people to continuously be excited about the game? There's so much that's out there. There's so many games. There's there's so much forms of entertainment and just news and, and just like mayhem that's going on right now in the world that a lot of times uh, things can get just kind of lost in the fodder. Um, but I think having like a, a marketing plan where you're like six months to a year before announce around the time that you're announcing your game and then just like consistently putting out content leading out to the launch date is absolutely key here. So that's also things like posting like gameplay gifts on Twitter, doing interviews, things like that. But I think six months to a year for just sort of like general game announcement. Um, but for Kickstarter, it's about two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And then um, when you look at the peak, it's mostly at the beginning and at the end of like a Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. How do you things going on in between those peaks in a, in a more authentic way? Because you told us that authenticity is key here. Mm -hmm. How do you find the good balance between interactive and not being too intrusive with your community. Yeah, so there's a couple of things to think about. So for a Kickstarter project in particular, right, and 100% and correct, uh, the life cycle of any Kickstarter project is that roughly the first like 48 to 72 hours, you'll have a high level of activity. Then you go through what we call the project plateau leading into the last 48 hours, which is, um, you know, the sort of last funding cycle where you have roughly the same level of activity as the first 48. Um, and the thing is, in that middle time, you should absolutely be posting to your social media every single day. Um, I did, unfortunately, forget to, to mention Instagram. One of the reasons I don't mention Instagram as like a, a social media space um, too much is that the way that Instagram is built is it's much more difficult to get people to kind of click on content to take them outside of Instagram just because it's it's just kind of the way that the app works. Um, but even posting on Instagram once a day, sort of reminding people, hey, I have a live Kickstarter project, like that's totally fine. It's 30 days. Um, the creators of Exploding Kitten, Kittens had a really good way of looking at Kickstarter projects, which is you have 30 days, which means you're essentially throwing a party for 30 days. And you wanna get people to, to either stay at the party or bring their friends to the party. So during that plateau period, it's not, don't think about it in terms of like spamming your audience, but posting once a day, reminding people, hey, I have a live Kickstarter project. I would sort of shift your focus and look at that more as like you have two weeks to get people to come to the last 48 hours of the funding cycle or like the last 48 hours of a party, right? Like if you think about it in terms of like going to a concert, it's, uh, it's sort of like, anticipating that encore that's probably always going to happen so getting people to come to the last 48 hours of the project is definitely key don't be afraid to post every single day but only post once a day about the project you don't want to like you know post every hour about the project that can get a little bit overwhelming mm -hmm. yes yeah, so i understand that it's a very time consuming issue to be uh, um, interacting with your community. Do you have some tips for small teams or uh, solo developers to, to keep this going on in a, in a very good way? Do you have maybe some tools to maintain all these communities at the same time that might be a bit more efficient for people who are out there on their own? Yeah, I mean, again, I think Discord is a really powerful tool. It, it kind of just like allows you to centralize things. I think if you're starting out, it's kind of like anything that kind of like, if you're starting anything for the first time, it's gonna be overwhelming, it's gonna be weird, and it's gonna be scary, but you kind of have to just stick with it. Like, I wish I could say it's super easy and it's great and it's fun and it's the best thing in the world, but like, I ran a Kickstarter project this year and it's exhausting. Um, it's very, very tiring to do all of that work. So having a plan ahead of time and trying to execute that plan is definitely key. So if it's something where you're like, wow, I don't even have a Twitter, like create a Twitter account, go mess around on it, kind of see what's going on, you know, on twitter.com and see like who you can kind of follow within the game space. Um, I think also like putting parameters and guidelines on yourself is totally okay. Can, this stuff can be really overwhelming. So if you're like, I'm gonna spend an hour every single day just on Twitter engaging with communities, like just give yourself an hour a day. And I think that's totally okay.
Okay, right. And uh, another question that came in just right now, what about studios who have different games? Should they still focus on like game accounts or is it better to create like a hub for the studio uh, or a publisher yeah. account to work from? Yeah, so I think if you have multiple games, but you're one studio, I think you should just focus on the studio. Um, also, like if you, it, there was a question about publisher accounts. Is that what I heard? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so if it, I mean, if you're a publisher, then you should just have your the publisher the publisher account. Um, I think if we're gonna if we're also gonna use examples here, so Devolver in particular does an incredible job of their um, their community management. I would check out what Devolver is doing, get in their Discord, check out their Twitter. Um, those are definitely sort of their two main spaces. Um, they have a voice that resonates with people and they have a voice that's uniquely theirs. Um, a couple other uh, people to follow and think about are, um, again, Kit Fox Games who made Boyfriend Dungeon, but specifically their community manager, Victoria Tran. I think she's just at, um, at the V Tran on Twitter. Victoria does an incredible job of uh, managing not only the Kitbox community, but also the community that she's built for herself as Victoria. Um, Victoria has also written a handful of different Medium articles about community management and community building. But I think looking at like, if you're looking at it from like an aspirational standpoint, like what publishers do you look up to as a publisher? Look at what they're doing on their social media and their community management. and you can steal from what they're doing in terms of like, oh, I really like the way that they talk to their community in this. Like, great, do that. Same with the studio. Like, look at what other studios are doing. And if it's if you're an individual and you're just like kind of doing it alone, but you have multiple titles, look at what Mike Bithel is doing. Look at what Rami is doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. And and if you set up your uh, Discord for the first, the very, very first time, mm -hmm. how do you get people to, to get in there, to see you, to uh, join your community, the first users? They're the yeah. hard ones. Yeah, no, that's totally, that's a great question. And uh, I think, again, it's similar to kind of newsletter signups. So having like a pinned tweet that has all of that information for people to access. So like, this is how you get to, this is how you're in the Discord. Um, having it in the signature of your email. Uh, having a link to your Discord is key. Um, having it on your Facebook, having it on your website, like just having it kind of out there and any anything that's associated with you, just having the option for people to kind of click on it and be a part of it. It's it's slow. Uh, you kind of just kind of, you got to keep at it. But having the information accessible in all um, forums and ways for people to communicate with you is key. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we talked about Discord. I received some questions about Instagram. You touched that uh, as well during your talk. But what about Steam Early Access? Could that work? Yeah, Steam Early Access can definitely work. Steam is a little bit tricky, though, because it's kind of hard for you to see a lot of the numbers. But I think with Steam, just having that information available is absolutely key. So having a way for people to like sign up for your Discord through Steam, having a way for people to follow you on social media stuff, like that's that's the best way to use it. Mm -hmm. Another question coming in. A lot of people are having a number of questions, which is great. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Best thing to do or the best medium to get that last 20% of backers? Oh, specifically the last 20%. Um, that's that's a very interesting question. I'm curious as to why there's a focus on the last 20%, but I guess um, if we're talking about the last 48 hours of a project, like I think the challenge here is like, if you're running a Kickstarter project and you're seeing that there's like a high level of engagement, but people aren't backing the project, I think it's okay to ask your community, like what's going on here? Why are people not backing the project? You all seem excited about what's happening, but what's the hesitation for you to not back the project? Um, I think, again, asking your community what's going on is kind of key. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's exactly what the community is doing right now because we're getting also some tips from people <laughs> who eyes for new discords. You can get a readable version made on discord.io. Mm -hmm. We'll share that information with you later on. Um, I also see here someone posting Mike Rose from No More Robots also had meaningful insights about yes. and good examples. Yes, so, thank uh, you for bringing that up. Mike is, is, a, is a wonderful, wonderful person to follow. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, one 
other question? I think you already explained a bit about it, but how would you rank the different social media in if we need to select a few because we just can't do all of them? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say the bottom of the barrel is Instagram. <laughs> um, it, it's just for games in particular, there's not a lot going on there. Um, that's much more for like personal accounts and truthfully, like Instagram is better for like artists, musicians, um, things that are a little bit more just like tangible. Um, so I would say Instagram bottom of the totem pole and then Facebook is probably next in terms of like, if we're ranking them from like the top four, um, mm -hmm. Facebook would be three. Like it's important to have a Facebook, but like, you know, um, the content that you post there is, it's the politics seems to be just sort of overplaying Facebook. So important to have, but you know, post when you can. Um, I would say Discord is probably number two. Um, I, I consider Discord to be a social media platform. It's, it's a forum, but like it's still, you know, it's still engagement. Uh, and number one is definitely Twitter. And that's only because the entire, again, the entire games industry is on Twitter. So being a part of that is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a very specific question here. Is there a difference in strategy between online based games and those on mobile devices? Oh, yes. So mobile is always going to be just a little bit more difficult. But I think, again, like it's about getting the content out there and it's about getting people excited about the content. And I think no matter what, just having a Twitter that that so people can see what you're doing, posting gifts, posting updates, um, just Twitter is going to be the best resource here. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, a kind of similar specific one is how to retain players in an RTS game. It's a hard question to answer, I guess. That's a hard question, and I think for me, that's not really a community management question. That's much more of a strategy question, so I don't think I'm the best person to answer that. Okay, well noted. Um, <laughs> so you said you did your own Kickstarter once. What were your personal learnings? Did you have, uh, were you satisfied with the community you were able to build? What did you learn from that? Yeah, um, I definitely was satisfied with the community that I was able to build. Uh, I actually ran a Kickstarter project with my band. So I ran a music project, which was very different than games. Um, it, I mean, my sort of findings were much more from the standpoint of like a Kickstarter employee. Like I, I work in games at Kickstarter. So like games is, is a huge part of my life, obviously. Um, so being able to run a project in a category that I am not intimately familiar with was fascinating it is very very different um so for example for for games on kickstarter we tell people they need to update their project like you need to post an update every other day um, the games community is very robust they're very smart they know what's going on they're very engaged with music we only had to post an update like once a week uh the community is just very very different so uh, it was interesting to like have all of this institutional knowledge about Kickstarter in terms of like Kickstarter as a whole, but then also Kickstarter games being other another side. Um, but seeing how within like a large community like Kickstarter, the factions of smaller communities, they, they are very different and there's nuance and you need to speak to them all in different ways. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the profile of your community is, is extremely important. Um, we received a question here, how do you set up that profile? Because games are layers and layers of different demographics. It's hard mm -hmm. to have that set up. Do you have some tips there? And I think that might be our last question. Yeah. So I mean, to be perfectly honest, like I think that you kind of need to decide what type of community it is that you want. So you have the option to really kind of like, uh, manage the type of community that you want to build. So if you want a place that's like uh, very progressive and very open and people are very like willing to have uh, interesting conversations and dialogues with one another, you kind of need to separate, you need to set that precedent. So you need to be able to do that, kind of like practice what you preach. Again, I think that Rami, Mike and Mike Bithel are, Mike, Mike Rose and Mike Bithel are three really great people to, to kind of follow and emulate in terms of like how they talk to their community. Um, they're very open, they're very really willing to have dialogue and things like that. I'd say like model yourself over what you uh, perceive to be like um, ideal community managers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great tip to end uh, this webinar with. Thank you. 
so much, Anja, to share your yeah. tips and insights and have some time to spend in this early morning for you. Yeah, um, no problem. Viewers, uh, for your feedback and numerous questions, um, we also learned from you. Um, please stay tuned for the next Flanders DC webinars. We'll be uh, making sure that uh, the slides are sent over to you and they include uh, the contact details of Anja in case you should, uh, should would have a question to uh, send directly to her. Hope to see you guys soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.